Stock indices are trading sideways, absolutely flat on the Nifty and the Sensex. Asia is a bit more down than upright right now. So Nikkei is down about a quarter of a percent. Taiwan is. Okay. Uh, the Nifty banking index is down close to about a half a percent. And both PSU and private sector are under pressure. So frontline banks like ICICI Bank, Kotak Mahindra Bank, HDFC Bank, State Bank of India, all of them down anywhere between half to one percent. Another stock, uh, you know, which is weak is LTI Mine Tree, uh, and this is a stock which is, uh, you know, it's down about a quarter of a percent. But from the beginning of the year, it's down about ten percent, and the expectation is that in the uh, Nifty rebalance, which will be effective September, LTI Mine Tree could be on its way out and replaced by uh, Trent and Divis, uh, by Trent. Uh, so LTI Mind Tree is a stock which is under pressure, but pharma is doing well, right? Divis, Dr. Reddy, Sipla, all of them looking smart. Absolutely. And you know, it's just one of those days, right, Rima, where the market is doing nothing. Yeah. But you're okay with that because of the kind of gains that we have under our belt and the kind of move that the Nifty has seen. So I think today is just one of those days of consolidation. Even globally, all eyes will be on the US, uh, you know, cues that come in later uh, in the day. And of course, you know, the, the interpretation of when, what the Fed would do. But I guess over 90% response in a CNBC global poll believe that the Fed will be cutting rates in the September policy. Mm. So in that sense, even that is something uh, that the market is prepared for. But in some market opinion, MK in its recent India strategy note highlights that the Q1 FY25 earnings season was weak with a negative profit growth and muted top line momentum across the board. But despite the rising share of negative surprises, the earnings forecast for the Nifty and the wider universe remains stable. So to discuss more on this report, we are joined by Seshadri Sen, the head of research and strategist at MK Global, who joins in. Um, Seshadri, hi, good morning, and thanks for joining in on CNBC TV 18. Uh, you know, it's very interesting because this was a bit of a uh, sort of mixed earning season that we had. But you tell us, what has the key takeaway been? And are there any sectors where you see both valuation as well as growth headroom now? Uh, thanks for hosting me and a uh, pleasure to be, to be back on, on the show. Um, yes, it was a mixed season and, and the aggregate numbers, I think, hide a lot of uh, interesting details. Uh, I think the key takeaway was that top line continues to be a challenge for most sectors. Uh, top line growth, you know, it was 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 uh, was not particularly exciting. The numbers are a little skewed by oil and gas uh, or energy, but even if you strip that out, uh, there there were some top line challenges uh, for a lot of sectors. Uh, margins, on the other hand, uh, the aggregate margins looked a little poor, but if you strip out energy, then the rest of the sectors actually did okay in terms of margins. So the trend that we've seen for the last few quarters that margins are holding up earnings, but uh, the top line is disappointing. That is what broadly continued. Um, if you see the sectoral performers, I think one uh, standout performer was uh, 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 Staples and FMCG. That is where we saw, and you have to look at it in context, it's Staples and FMCG are not going to give you 30% earnings growth. Uh, but there was an acceleration in EPS growth from uh, in staples from the fourth quarter to the first quarter. From, from I think, 8% growth, it went up to 13% PAP growth. Uh, for very few sectors, actually, we saw the earnings growth actually accelerate over quarter on quarter, meaning the, you, you didn't have a higher earnings growth in the first quarter than you had in the fourth quarter. But in general terms, you know, this is relative, but in absolute terms, uh, industrials continue to be one of the strongest earnings growth sectors at uh, 27%. Uh, and uh, durables and, and financials continue to perform. Durables includes autos continue to perform strongly, though, you know, vis a vis the first quarter, the numbers were a little soft. Uh, so that's the overall, overall uh, picture. Uh, you know, I would say, you know, the notable performances were from industrials and uh, FMCG. Uh, on staples. Okay, so industrials and staples. Uh, Sishadri, thank you for uh, joining in. So Q1 on expected lines was muted and that's in the rear view mirror now. The question is on the earnings growth going forward. Now, MK recently concluded their conference where you had in-depth con you know, conversations with corporates across sectors. What is the feedback? Uh, because so far, FI25, FI26 earnings estimates were unchanged. But is there a risk that this muted earnings growth will continue even in Q2, Q3, Q4, 
putting at risk FI25 or FI26 earnings estimates? Yeah, let me answer that in two parts. Let me answer the second part first in terms of the risk to earnings. We did note in our in our in our report that there was no material change, and and we not no, don't just look at Nifty earnings. We look at a disaggregated an analysis of about 350 top companies as to where their and you know estimates are moving. And there also we found no cause for concern, uh, and that is a much stronger because that's a disaggregated number. You know, there's a law of large numbers that kicks in there. And and we don't we don't see a cause of concern that this quarter led to mass downgrades. Uh, what we did note, however, there was the pace of upgrades also has slowed. Uh, so there's stability in earnings forecasts. Uh, we, we, we know in ter terms of so I don't think you know in short answer I don't think we need to worry about a, a major downgrade coming up. And that's a, a feature of the India's post COVID rally that. You know, typically you start with high earnings in, in in April and we end up with a much lower number in, in, in the following March. That trend has been broken and I don't see that that trend coming back at least in FI25. The feedback from our conference was largely was very positive. Uh, overall, we would say that despite, you know, all some of the pressures that have come up in recent times, uh, managements remain very confident, especially in the small and mid cap manufacturing space. Uh, managements continue to be a confident of future growth on a multi-year basis, not just in the in the coming quarters. Two are not changing their long-term plans. So the long-term plans include increasing capex. We've noted that even more conservative companies are continuing with their capex plans and are incurring new capex plans. Uh, some of them are diversifying, entering new business uh, areas. You know, allied but new product segments. Uh, some of them are still looking at m and the cash rich ones are still looking at m and none of those plans seem to have changed in the last six, eight months. And that is something that we take take a lot of uh, confidence from. Uh, the other yeah. notable feature from the conference is that as far as consumption is concerned, premium and urban consumption is slowing down while uh, rural and mass consumption is picking up. This is a reversal of a four-year trend. As you may know, the post-COVID market has seen uh, rural and, and mass consumption do badly while premium and urban has done well. That seems to be reversing. It's too early to say whether that's a, a, a long-term trend or a medium-term trend, but something that we are keeping an eye out on because that will mean uh, a lot of implications on which stocks uh, well, you know, investors should hold. Okay, so slow consumption, uh, slowing consumption at the premium end remains a bit of a concern for you. But mass consumption recovery is a significant tailwind. I want to delve a little deeper into that. When you talk about mass consumption recovery, what is it exactly? Because now we are seeing, you know, a lot more urbanization as well. So uh, perhaps stocks like, say, something like a Zomato, Nika sitting at a fresh 52-week high today. Then, of course, you have, uh, you know, stocks like Ola, etc., which are doing very well. Um, are these niche consumption stories something that you like? Or would you want to stick to the traditional consumption guys, whether it's, you know, traditional auto sector or FMCG? Uh, a mixture of both. Uh, so let me talk about traditional. So, so we prefer, say, two-wheelers to passenger vehicles. We prefer staples to, 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 to uh, discretionary consumption, right? Uh, though that is the way we would play. We would, in, within the retail space, we would look for particular mass consumption uh, you know, lower end retail retail chains uh, rather than the premium retail chains, uh, especially as some of those names may have underperformed in the last three, four years. So, so that's, you know, the, the traditional end. As far as the new trends are concerned, yes, we are very excited about that area overall. But one will have to pick and choose. One will have to look at which companies are genuinely, you know, innovative, making an impact. Uh, and are demonstrating ability to to show long term growth uh, versus some of the companies which you know maybe sort of showing a short term growth etc. But there's a risk that penetration will soon die. It's it's a tricky area. Uh, it's high risk reward. If you get it right, then there is a, you know a really serious long term upsides to be made. But as we've seen, if you get it wrong, then some of these these companies can. Uh, you know, uh, valuations are not, not really comfortable and, you know, there is no prof underlying profitability. So, you know, sorry, that's a sort of uh, uh, not a direct answer, but one has to be careful of that space because it's high risk reward. Fair enough. So if you had to construct your portfolio today, say Shadri, how would you do it? 
What would the constituents be? So we are, we, you know, we 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 published a lot on this. So so our our views are very very clear. Uh, we are underweight on financials because we think that financials, the derating that we've seen post COVID, is still yet to be done. The sector is entering a new low growth phase, uh, and valuations are yet to adjust. So we are underweight financials. We are overweight at the moment. We are overweight staples and IT. Uh, we did that, you know, post elections because we we found valuations to be attractive. Now some of the valuation comfort has gone. But we are seeing, you know, an upgrade cycle start to kick in there. So we wait and watch that space, but we continue to retain our overweight there. Uh, we are overweight durables, uh, which includes autos. Uh, now one has to be selective, but overall as a sector, we think that the auto cycle, uh, CVs we remain confident of, two wheelers we remain confident of, and the auto cycle will continue for some for some time. Uh, and and we will we will continue to play that. You know, one may have to do some sit, you know nifty stock picking there but th that sector we continue to like industrials from a fundamentals perspective is one of our favorite sector we think from a three to five year perspective that is where we will see the maximum growth but we thought valuations ran well ahead of themselves and therefore there is some valuation sanity which needs to revert uh, to return before one can one can dive into that sector having said that there are plenty of it's a really large sector with lots of small and mid cap stocks so as long as valuations remain, come, you know, we, we are not out of whack, there is still ideas to be harvested there. But as a sector, we'd be a little cautious. Okay, well, we will leave it at that. Thanks a lot, Shishadri, for joining in and speaking to us on CNBC TV 18. Appreciate your time here and speaking to us about your report as well. Uh, that's MK with their latest India, India strategy note and the way forward. Let's slip into a quick break. On the other side of the break, we'll discuss what's buzzing in the commodity space with Manisha Gupta. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Trading Hour on CNBC TV 18. Let's shift focus to the commodity space now. Manisha Gupta joins in. And today we have... So we are trading at a six-week highs right now. And this is because of the increased fund buying that the sector really seems to be looking at. And metals essentially were on the shorter side with the kind of sell-off that we saw in the month of June and July. And the cost of alumina also seems to be rising in our Australia. So all factors really supporting aluminum prices there. When it comes to copper, well, that also saw some changes suggesting that you could be looking at a surplus in case of copper not just this year but the next as well the one interesting one comes in from Macquarie where they say that this year could be 260 increase to almost 436,000 tons there there's a similar report from PNB Baripa which says that for this year 150 to 200,000 tons of surplus could international copper study group which says that the first four months are until from Jan to May they have seen 416,000 tons of surplus already so these are the numbers that check the keep the prices under check rather thank you very much uh, for that um Banks, by the way, have sold off a little bit more. When we started the show at about 11 o'clock, the Nifty Bank was down 250 points. Now it's down 370 points. But life insurance companies are coming in for some buying. So SBI Life is inched up a little bit more, up one and a quarter percent. Today, there's that Bernstein note coming through on life insurance. They've got an outperform call on SBI Life, HDFC Life and Max Financial. They say private life insurers in India present a good way to get exposure to high income households and private life insurers also have stable growth. So they're sounding the bullish note on life insurance companies and these stocks are doing quite well. In the mid cap end of uh, market, um, there are big movers. So Updata is the one which catches your attention, moving up on good volumes. You've got Edelweiss Financial, which is up another six, six and a half percent. This week it's seen an 18 percent rally. Sriram Properties, oil marketing companies like HPCL, BPCL continue to inch up. We will get into a break. We'll come back and continue to put this spotlight on individual stocks that are buzzing on the back of fresh brokerage commentary. Stay tuned.
Welcome back. Let's talk about Tech Mahindra because that's down nearly half a percent in trade. Now, CLSA has downgraded Tech Mahindra from an outperform to a hold rating. And remember, the Tech Mahindra was one of CLSA's top bets. It was their anti-consensus call and their top pick since January of 2024. But now CLSA has downgraded Tech Mahindra. One, because the stock has outperformed. So year to date, Tech Mahindra has given a return of 26%. It's outperformed the Nifty IT, which is up 18%, and the Nifty, which is up 14%. Also, CLSA's estimates are lower than consensus expectations. Now, the reason why CLSA is has lower than ex consensus expectations in terms of earnings growth, they say, one, the global telecom company's capex has largely remained unchanged in this calendar year. And historically, there is a very large correlation between uh, the global telecom company's capex and the telecom vertical revenue growth for the Indian IT companies. And this year, there hasn't been any change in the telecom, global telecom company's capex plan. So therefore, the telecom verticals for the Indian IT companies are likely to give you a mid to high single digit kind of uh, you know, returns. So that's reason number one. And two, there is a possibility that competition is also picking up because peers like an Infosys, Wipro, they've all announced large deals in the telecom vertical. So keeping all these, you know, fundamental factors in mind and plus the fact that the stock has outperformed with a 26% return on a year-to-date basis, CLSA today has downgraded the stock. Their target price stands at 16.25, pretty close to where the stock currently is. Okay, thanks a lot for that, Reema. That's on Tech Mahindra. But Varun Beverages has been gaining on the back of positive commentary from a Bofa Securities report. Mangalam tells us more on that. Mangalam, over to you. Good morning. So there is a note that has come in from Bofa Securities on Varun Beverages. They see the current pullback in the stock price as an opportunity to buy. Uh, the pullback was shallow because, you know, the recent high on the stock was a little over 1700 and 20 odd rupees uh, from there the stock saw a bit of a correction and today is doing extremely well why is that because Bofa believes that the business fundamentals of the company are fairly strong. In fact, uh, you know, they actually see some upside coming in from two different things that the company is seeding. One, they have increased their distribution beyond carbonated drinks. So, you know, new products like dairy beverages, energy and sports drinks are doing extremely well. The energy drink Sting is one of the biggest volume drivers of the last couple of years and that's been, you know, leading the turnaround for the company itself. So that's something that could give further upside. And add to that, you know, geographical diversifications as well, new territories, like South Africa and Congo can also be seen as an upside for the company. They had made an acquisition out there, so scaling up of that and increasing the share of Pepsi out there would be extremely crucial. And the third thing to watch out for would be their foray into, into the snacks business, which will uh, increase the total addressable market for the company. Remember, beyond beverages, going into snacks is a big uh, market for Pepsi itself. Over 50% of the PepsiCo revenue actually comes in from the snacks vertical. If that were to happen, then that would add another diversification opportunity in the stock, understandably higher by about 4%. Thank you very much for that. Get into a break. We'll come back and talk about the market technicals with Mitesh Thakkar. Welcome back to Trading Hour on CNBC TV 18. Well, today everyone's talking about Mazgao Doc. It's actually a stock that people have been tracking uh, for a while now because it's fallen about 15% from its all-time highs. Uh, but uh, the company actually, uh, you know, came out and allayed a lot of concerns about the slowdown in terms of orders, etc. So let me just quickly take you through what they said. They spoke about how the order book continues to be very strong at about 40,000 crores. Uh, that order book will be executed over the next four to five years. They expect additional 27,000 crores worth of submarine orders over the next few months. And they also spoke about how their balance sheet is intact, they are a cash surplus company and they have no working capital concerns. Let's not forget that despite the 15% fall from the top, the stock is still up 94% this year. So the big question that we're asking is, will the stock resume its buying after the management allayed a lot of the concerns on the company? Uh, let's in fact listen to what the management had to say uh, earlier on key excerpts from our conversation with Sanjeev Singhal, who is the chairman and managing director of Mazgao Dock Shipbuilders. Uh, we have a current order book of around 40,000 crores. 
Recently, we have, we have added 4,600 crores of a offshore project from ONGC. Uh, last year also, we received fresh orders uh, worth approximately 7,000 crores. So uh, if you look at the order, the number of vessels which we are executing today, uh, we have orders for around 30 ships which are to be delivered uh, over next couple of years. It is a order for P-75I submarines with AIP fitted where MDL is participating along with TKMS Germany. Uh, as per the reports available with us, uh, the field evaluation trials of uh, Musgaon Dock shipbuilders and uh, TKMS have been found to be successful. And this project also would be progressing at a desired pace. Uh, so maybe next year we can expect uh, uh, positive developments on this account. Uh, we are uh, out of four destroyers. We have already delivered three and uh, we are uh, scheduled to deliver the fourth one also this year. So this project would be closing. So any questions which are uh, kept with respect to liabilities that may arise. Uh, we are a cash surplus company. Uh, there are no working capital concerns and uh, there are no liabilities in the form of debts or any short, uh, any loans. So uh, with respect to the uh, investments also, there is a, a sizable uh, accrual uh, in the form of interest income. Uh, and uh, as far as the projects are concerned, projects may reasonable margin would be something around 10 to 12 percent. And uh, taking uh, the repair verticals, the offshore projects, which we have now uh, started in a, a significant manner, uh, I, uh, without assigning any numbers, I would say that anything about 10 percent, 12 percent would be a reasonably healthy margin. Welcome back. There is some recovery in private sector financials. Indescent Bank should come up for you on your screen. Now it's back in the green. And the other one is Axis Bank. Now up half a percent from the day's low. It's been a recovery of more than one and a quarter percent. And even the Nifty Bank has trimmed some of its earlier losses, though it's still in the red. Mitesh is now back with us for a quick technical check on the markets. Mitesh, uh, any thoughts on this Nifty Bank recovery and the in individual stocks? And what would your top ideas be? See, I'm, I'm still positive on the bank fifty. What I'm waiting for is to get past the 50,800 to 820 mark. Once that happens, you know, you can be slightly more aggressive in buying. But I do have uh, Chola Finance as a buy recommendation. Uh, keep a stop below levels of 1372 here and look for targets of around 1420, 1425. Uh, and then Alchem is also on the buy side. Uh, keep a stop at about 5720 for targets of 5950. Uh, Okay, thanks a lot for that. Uh, well, like getting you an exclusive now, we learn from sources that tightening the news around tax evasion, the Income Tax Department in its Central Action Plan for FY25 has asked all its officers across the country to keep a close vigil on IVF clinics and medical colleges, apart from the usual hotel and luxury retailers. Timsey joins in to get us the details. Timsey, over to you. Tightening the news around tax evasion, the Income Tax Department in its recent Central Action Plan for the current fiscal has asked all its field formations to keep a close vigil on IVF clinics and medical colleges, apart from the usual hotels and luxury retailers. Income Tax Department in its plan says, and I quote, Section 139A requires PAN for certain transactions, but there is no mechanism to ensure compliance. To address this, high-value expenditures should be verified using departmental data identifying and verifying potential circumvention sources such as hotels, luxury retailers, IVF clinics and medical colleges is crucial with this information. According to the taxman at the helm of the Central Board of Direct Taxes, there's an urgent need to address widespread circumvention of income reporting requirements of for cash transactions over 2 lakh rupees. It is essential to identify high-risk sectors like hotels, luxury retailers and medical facilities. That's what this particular section says and that's what the taxman has said. So let's see how soon uh, taxman begins to uh, keep a close vigil on IVF clinics and medical colleges and medical facilities and what is the final outcome of this particular drive. Back to you. Thank you very much for that. Get into a break. As we do that, we'll get you some views from the Motilal Oswal 20th Annual Global Investor Conference. Niket Shah, CIO at Motilal Oswal Mutual Fund, said he's cautious in the market and has been very selective. He also shares his view on telecom, quick commerce, EVs and the IT sector. This quarter, Nifty earnings growth has been about 4 to 5%, yeah. which is probably slowest in the last 16 quarters. 
mid cap earnings growth has been about 5 to 6 percent again slowest in the last 16 quarters uh, and we have been slightly more cautious on the markets been very very selective our focus of this year is to do less mistakes yeah right so when we started this year you could clearly see you know earnings growth uh, kind of slowing down and we want to ensure that we don't do you know significant mistakes this year if you don't do mistakes this year i think you will end up in a very good outcome at the end of the year so from a 25 26 stock portfolio we're now actually down to about 16 17 stocks we're trying to make the portfolio more and more sharper by the day to ensure that you know there's no mistake so that's broadly i think what we have been up to you know, IT hasn't done well in the last three years, right? I mean, some of our IT holdings within the mid-cap and the small-cap space have done extremely well. But overall, from an industry standpoint, I think it has gone through some challenges in the last two years. We believe post-US election, some of those challenges are likely to go out. Uh, as, you know, the, the pipeline of the IT in terms of the funnel or the deal uh, pipeline that most of the corporates have been talking about is very, very healthy. So that continues to remain healthy. I think most of the corporates or enterprise in US or Europe are waiting for some clarity on US elections to get over and that uh, the, the spending will, I think, in, in, in next year should come back in a, in a meaningful fashion. Initial part of the year, we did highlight that telecom looks like the sector of the year. And the key thesis was that India has actually seen no major ARPU increases if you take a 10-year uh, back track record, right? So I, our view was that every year from year on, India needs to take a tariff hike because from the second half of the next year, most of these telcos have to start paying to government for the spectrum that they had bought 10 years yes. back. Yes. Uh, and for me to pay and for some of these enterprises to go and pay to the government, you need earnings, right? And there is no way you can get earnings uh, without a tariff hike. Sure. So I think we will see a tariff hike even next year and in the following year. So we might see a tariff hike every year on year basis, okay. which essentially means a, a very strong growth for the sector. Food delivery becomes a cash cow over the longer term. The real excitement is quick commerce business. Uh, in our opinion, for the next three to four years, you should see at least 125 to 150 percent kind of a top line or a GMB growth for some of these companies, uh, which is quite staggering, right? And this kind of model is only, you know, at scale is likely to happen in India. Uh, because of the way our supply chains are there, the way our auto penetration is there. And we all have, uh, you know, a, a budget that we run on a monthly basis. So we do do monthly uh, pantry filling on a weekly basis, right? So that I think is quite, uh, you know, I would say unique to what Indian styles are. And I think these kind of business models are just started, uh, just scratching the surface. What is actually surprising to us is that the tier two markets, hmm. where in some of the quick commerce, the tier two markets, unit economics are much better than tier one markets. The adoption of tier two markets for quick commerce is much faster than tier one markets. So that has actually been a big of, bit of a surprise for us. Hmm. And we believe the runways uh, is likely to stay here for the next four to five years. So we just scratched the surface in our opinion. I think EV penetration has to move up in India, uh, but I think both of them will coincide, whether it's ICE and EV both together. But within EV, I think we have very clear understanding that whether it's four-wheeler, two-wheeler, there is no major profit pool to be made, at least over the next two to three years. The profit pool is actually in the three-wheeler LCV side because the vehicle tends to run for a longer duration of time in the in the same day, and hence it makes unit economic sense if you take a five to seven-year view for that vehicle. So you know the LCV market, the tractor market, and the three-wheeler market is where we continue to like within the EV space. Welcome back. Well, just one update on the market. It is getting, um, I mean, it's been choppy, no two ways about that. So as you can see, there are some jagged edges on the screen. Uh, it's flat with a bit of consolidation. But now some of the indices like uh, the Bank Nifty, etc. are starting to give up a little bit of their gains. So let's see uh, which way it goes from here. There's a large trade on delivery at the moment. Uh, so just keep an eye out on that as well. A couple of stocks though continue to hit fresh 52 week highs. So just wanted to get that on board. Nika is at a fresh 52 week high today. 6.5% higher on that one. PC Jewelers at a fresh 52 week high. So there's plenty to look at this morning. Uh, there's something like uh, Patanjali Foods that is at a fresh 52 week high. Just Dial, ICICI Pro, uh, Voltas has been doing very well. Um, and a couple of others like uh, Glenmark Pharma as well. So despite the market consolidating, there's plenty of stock-specific action. But GETND India is under pressure after the stock snapped its three-day gaining streak. Vamakshi is joining in for more details. Vamakshi, over to you. 
Well, yes, the stock is reeling under pressure today after GE Grid Alliance, BV and Grid Equipments, who are the promoters of the company, announced that they are in process of reviewing their shareholding structure. Now, keep in mind that GE Grid Alliance holds nearly 6.5% stake in GE TEND uh, and Grid Equipments holds nearly 68.5% stake. The promoter group said that they are looking to simplify the holding structure. They will evaluate and assess their current shareholding in the company and evaluate the possibility of a minority stake sale as well. Uh, in fact, they also said that uh, they have a strong intention to continue as the majority shareholder of the company. But that said, there are a couple of factors to look at as well. Uh, what it, we will be watching out for, uh, number one, what is the percentage stake that they are looking to sell? There has to be some more clarity on that, which will come from the company uh, as they finish this assessment. And secondly, we will also watch out for the interest level from investors, given that the stock has already rallied by almost 240 base, uh, percent on a buy to date basis and is up nearly 300 and 80 percent in the last one year not just that even the valuations are quite elevated as compared to the historical averages so overall uh, we will have to be uh, watching out for a couple of factors but uh, given the development that we have right now the stock is reading under pressure thank you very much uh, for that the other one we're looking at is scient because earlier today scient sold about 1.2 crore shares or 14 and a half percent stake in a company called Scient DLM. Earlier, Scient DLM was a part of Scient. Uh, you know, it was into design-led manufacturing. Then the two companies, you know, they delisted Scient DLM. Uh, and Scient had about a 66% stake in Scient DLM. And they brought it down by another 14.5%. Now, Sign DLM is under pressure by 2.5% because of the large block that's taking place. But pull up Sign stock price. Now, they're going to be getting in close to about $100 million because the total value of the transaction was about 860 crore. Now, it's positive for Sign because, one, they're getting $100 million and that, the company has said, will be used for M&A and debt repayment. According to JP Morgan, the company's DET business, their main business, has about $47 million of debt and that can be partly repaid using the sale proceeds. The company has also said that they plan to invest in their semiconductor business. And according to JP Morgan, even auto is a space where the company could be looking and making some acquisitions. So JP Morgan has an overweight call on the stock target price, 2100. Kotak 2 is bullish on sign. The sign has been an underperformer. Its numbers have been a bit patchy. But Kotak 2 maintains a buy and their target price is 2050. Okay. Well, PNB housing is also in focus on the back of... Uh... A uh, block deal. Abhishek joins in with more details on that. Abhishek, over to you. Finance is up in trade today. Now, sources do tell us that General Atlantic Singapore Fund has sold stake in PNB Housing. So, a large block took uh, place today, about 1.39 crore shares, which is more than 5% of the equity in PNB Housing Finance. So, a uh, flow price was set at 7.75 per share, which was at a discount of 4.5% to yesterday's closing price. However, the trade took place at 803 per share, which is 3.5% above the flow price. This is a clean out trade because more more than 5% equity was what uh, you know General Atlantic was holding in uh, PNB Housing Finance and they have sold their entire stake. It's a clean out trade. Okay, we've uh, snapped that connection with uh, you know Abhishek, but PNB Housing Finance is up close to about 8.5% because as he pointed out for General Atlantic, it's a clean out trade. So that supply overhang is out of the way and the stock is surging close to about 8.5%. It started open trade about 850 uh, on the flattish side, but since then, it's added on more than about 25 rupees in today's trade. It's been a bit of a drag. It's not been a big outperformer. Year-to-date, it's up 12.5%, and most of the gains today, uh, most of the gains of that year-to-date move have come through um, today. Um, outside of that, um, just a quick check on the markets. Just Dial is also a big mover. So these internet-related stocks continue to gather steam. So Just Dial has hit a fresh high, 8.5% uh, up on that. And this stock is up close to about 80%. Um, you know, in the last one year and 70% since the beginning of the year. And Nelco, this is a company which provides telecom infrastructure-related services. Nelco is up 20%, locked in an upper circuit. And on the way down, Unicommerce gives up a little bit of uh, gains after the blockbuster rally over the last two days. Still up quite a bit. 231 compares with an issue price of 108. But Unicommerce is seeing some profit booking. Get into a break. We'll come back with more.
Welcome back. Well, for now, the market is very, very quiet. There's not too much to update, actually, on the index itself. Just that Mazgao Dock is building up in terms of, uh, you know, both volume as well as price action. And a couple of other names, uh, you know, some of these jeweler companies, PC jewelers, etc., are doing pretty well at the moment. But former RBI Governor Raghuram Rajan has said that the US Fed Chair Jerome Powell should display masterful uncertainty at his Jackson Hole speech later this week. Speaking to CNBC TV 18, Rajan also said that the US Fed Chair should not guide the markets on a rate cut. He also warned that China's slowdown is serious and structural. Let's listen in. I suspect that in his Jackson Hole speech, Chairman Power will, uh, you know, try not to lock himself in into a course of action in September. The prediction is there will be a cut, but the question is how big a cut? And a lot of that depends on the, uh, you know, jobs report for the month of August. You know, to paraphrase Dr. Reddy, masterful uncertainty is what I'd leave it at. Uh, I wouldn't try and guide the market more than I have to. The Chinese slowdown is serious. It's it's a structural slowdown because their uh, basic uh, sort of um, um, growth supporters, um, the real estate sector is in deep trouble and still hasn't found uh, a bottom. So there will be uh, price uh, falls are significant. Since 2021, housing starts are down 65 percent. So uh, this is a economy which depended a lot on construction. That has been taken out of the equation. I would not uh, focus too much on, you know, what those growth numbers are. It, it, it's important they, they look healthy, but I would look at the uh, quality of that growth. And that is why the jobs issue becomes uh, really important. We've had a very capital intensive growth in, in our manufacturing sector. If you look at the uh, segments of the IIP that are doing particularly well, they're typically the more capital intensive segments and the labor intensive segments are not. We are getting the China plus one flows. Why is it that they're not creating many more textile jobs, many more leather jobs? Well, with that, it's a wrap on Trading R from the entire team. Thank you for watching. We leave the Nifty flat, but it's above that 24,700 mark. Midcaps outperform a bit and banks underperform. Uh, thank you for watching the show.